Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is February 5th, 1987. My home group is the West Portland Group in Portland, Oregon. Very grateful to be sober and, uh, and uh, very grateful to be asked to do something like this. I don't know if, uh, if anybody will get anything out of anything I have to say, but I know that, uh, that whenever I do this, when I share honestly about myself, share my experiences with the idea of maybe helping somebody else, that I enlarge my spiritual life. And I come away with something. So for that, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, Howard, uh, Howard had asked me. Uh, he knew my, I have a brother that just moved down here, and uh, just bought a house up in uh, Scottsdale. He's uh, he plays baseball and was down here for spring training, and um, just bought a house in Scottsdale. And uh, some of you might have seen it. It's kind of a tan stucco house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, Howard asked if I would t- I would talk at his meeting, and uh, so I, I'm I'm glad to do that. In keeping with the format, um, I'm, uh, I was told to share a little bit of what it used to be like, and uh, and then spend the majority of my time on what happened and what it's like now. What it used to be like, just to kind of sum up my drinking, um, I became a daily oblivion drinker, and the last uh, two years of my drink, I drank for 11 years. For whatever reason, it progressed very rapidly. I, got to, I was a daily drinker my entire career. My last two years, I was a daily oblivion drinker. I was arrested 14 times for alcohol-related arrests. Uh, I was in several treatment centers, hospitalized for uh, alcohol withdrawal. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I spoke at a meeting about six months ago, and I was doing exactly the same thing, uh, just kind of highlighting my, my drinking career. Before the meeting, I was going through it. Okay, 14 alcohol-related arrests, Three DUIs, uh, no job, daily oblivion, blackout drinking, and then I had a little thought: God, maybe I'm not really an alcoholic. <laughs> and uh, you know, um, the thing about that is, is, and, and I'm going to come back to that for a second. I'm going to talk about step ten right off the bat. Uh, uh, that really bothered me. You know, here I am getting ready to talk and. Uh, and I get nervous enough doing this anyway, and then I have this thought, you know, and, you know, why would I have that thought? And it created some fear. But anyway, um, all that stuff I mentioned doesn't make me an alcoholic. Those are just things that happen as a result of my drinking. What makes me an alcoholic, I was somebody that when I was not drinking, I felt different than, apart from, I was very self-conscious. I mean, extremely self-conscious. I was afraid of everybody. Uh, I was the type of person that if I was not drinking, if I was walking down the side of, on a sidewalk and somebody was coming the other way, I would cross the street to avoid having to say hello to them. And um, I had extreme loneliness, regardless of whether I was with people or not. Um, I felt different than, apart from, and, uh, and full of depression, just black type depression and tremendous amounts of anxiety. And what makes me an alcoholic is the fact that when I had a certain amount of alcohol in my system, it solved all that. It allowed me to be a participant in life. Ten drinks made me feel like what I thought everybody else felt like normally. Ten drinks, as a type of person, as we came down Scottsdale to Rural Road to to the meeting here, um, there's a lot of like sidewalk cafes and so forth. As a practicing alcoholic, I was the type of person that if I was not drinking, I would start to, I wouldn't even walk past those restaurants because I could hear those people judging me in there. And I would have their conversations for them, you know. And they would just, you know, I knew that they were talking about me and it was all about me. Kind of like almost self centeredness may be one of my problems, you know. (laughs) And, um, but with 10 drinks, man, I could walk not only in front of a place like that. But I could go into a place like that, and I could own a place like that. And uh, the problem with the 10 drinks is, is that um, I didn't seem to have the ability to maintain that level of comfort I got from 10 drinks. 
I would drink to excess to black out, come to the next morning, shake, hear things. I'd have auditory hallucinations um, when I was coming off of alcohol. I thought everybody, I thought, I didn't realize that that was alcohol withdrawal. I thought everybody had that, uh, you know, that I thought it was just a normal part of a hangover. I had no idea that that was withdrawal. And, um, and do it all over, swear it off, you know, with and without a solemn oath, all that stuff that chapter three in the big book talks about. And, uh, and then do it one more time. Um, coming back to, uh, I was talking about that meeting I was speaking at. Uh, I had some fear about, you know, God, why am I thinking that? This is six months ago. I'd, uh, I turned 18 in February and so I had 17 years. And, you know, why would I have a thought like that? And it really bothered me. And in the 10th step, it says that we continue to watch for fear, dishonesty, resentment, and selfishness. And when these crop up, we ask God to remove them. We share them with somebody, and then we resolutely turn our thoughts to somebody we can help, and then love and tolerance is code. And we owe, make amends if we owe any. And um, one of the solutions that uh, has been absolutely vital in my program has been that tenth step and picking up the telephone, asking God to remove whatever it is that's bothering me, picking up that telephone and sharing it with somebody. And, and then hopefully the person on the other end having some identification uh, with them. Um, and what I did is I picked up the telephone and I called about six or seven different people, all with more time than me, explained the story, and, um, and every single one of them laughed just like you guys did, and then they shared their own little story about it. And something is magical in that identification, you know, when, when, because I have a disease that tells me that I am the only one that has this. I'm the only person at 17 and a half years of sobriety that has a thought, maybe I'm not an alcoholic or, you know. And, uh, and I didn't want to believe it. It wasn't like a thought that I ran with. I mean, it was just a thought, but it really bothered me. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for those people that are willing to share their experience. I, I called, uh, I called uh, six or seven different people. Every one of them shared their own story. And, uh, and through that identification, something magical happens where I'm not alone with that anymore. And, I, and then I can turn it over to God, go back out, and be of service. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the, the last couple weeks of my drinking because um, in the 10th and 11th step, it talks about that we're to look uh, for inspiration and an intuitive thought. And um, one of the things about me is not so much taking the action about looking for intuitive thoughts or asking for intuitive thoughts or, or, or inspiration, but I have a conscious decision that when I get an intuitive thought to act on that intuitive thought because my mind will tell me that, you know, will dismiss it as stupid, as I'm manufacturing this to kind of have some sort of AA, there are no coincidences thing, story that I can go to the meeting and tell this is what happened to me, you know, then there are no coincidences. And so I, I very, what, na what comes naturally is dismissing inspiration and intuitive thoughts. And so I have a choice to not act on dismissing it, but to actually act as if it is an is a, uh, intuitive thought. What happened to me in my last uh, several weeks of, uh, of drinking is that I, uh, I got out of jail, eight days of uh, jail for my third DUI. About three days after that, I uh, was arrested again, and uh, the police department, who had come to know me fairly well, had uh, taken me aside and said, God, Chris, you've, you know, you've got a hell of a drinking problem. You've got to do something about this. You need to go see this guy, Joe F. He's an expert on alcoholism. Go see this guy. He can help you out. And, uh, you know, and I, yeah, whatever, you know. And so next day, I'm walking down... Uh, downtown and um, there's this one of those sidewalk preachers that uh, you know stands on the sidewalk with the Bible and spouts uh, scripture to anybody that will listen and I knew this guy his name was Monty I knew him from jail and uh, <laughs> and he uh, as I came by I said hey Monty and he's like hey Chris and you know he's got his Bible open and he reads something I had no idea what it was but he reads some scripture and I walked a few more steps and I thought you know, that kind of ties into what the cops were saying last night, that I should go see this Joe F. guy. You know, there, and, uh, and I took a few more steps, and I thought, you know, I've been to enough AA meetings, you know, and I know that they say there are no coincidences and, and so forth. 
And, uh, and I kind of smiled and I thought, what would happen if for once in my life I didn't dismiss something like this as stupid and actually followed through with it and acted on it as if maybe there's a remote possibility that there's something to this whole thing. And so almost out of amusement, and, and I desperately wanted to quit drinking, by the way. I mean, I wanted to quit drinking more than anything and, uh, uh, and I had, been, had wanted to quit for a long time. And um, anyway, so I acted on that. And I thought, I'm going to go see Jeff, I tur- or uh, Joe F. And I turned around and went up to go see this guy. And uh, on the way up there, I was like, it's like, please not Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. Please be aversion therapy, 10 days of a couple two-day follow-ups, and then his life's wonderful. And I got up there, and sure enough, it was Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and you know, he told me his story, did what it you know, talks about in the chapter, working with others. And, uh, and he asked me if I wanted to go to a meeting. And I, I had a, for whatever reason, I had a sense of obligation to actually go to the meeting with him. I didn't want to go, but I went. And I went to this meeting, and this meeting was a meeting. Their format was it was a speaker discussion meeting. The speaker would talk for about 20 minutes, and then they'd call on people for about half the meeting. Then they'd draw numbers, and if your number was picked, you got to talk. But it, was a fifth, they, it wasn't a fifth tradition meeting in the sense it was called a fifth tradition meeting. And, and I'm going to bring this up because this is important when I'm carrying the message. If I'm carrying the message to somebody one-on-one or if I'm in a meeting where I'm you know, sharing some of my experience with the idea of helping somebody that's new. But their habit at this meeting is, is that if there was, regardless of what the chosen topic was, if there was somebody there for their first, second, or third meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, the speaker would talk a little bit of what, their, what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. And every single person that they would call on would do exactly the same thing. And, uh, and then everybody that was part of the raffle uh, did the same thing. And I sat in the back of the room, <clears throat> and little by little, I started identifying with what these people were talking about. Now, I'd been to a lot of meetings before, a lot being 15 or 20. I mean, you know, not a lot, lot. But, um, uh, and I'd never identified because I'd never been to a meeting where this had taken place. I'd always been to meetings that were more discussion-type meetings where people were checking in or wanting to tell you about their week, kind of almost like a group therapy flavor to the discussion meeting. And, uh, and... I'm not knocking those kind of meetings. I don't attend them, but uh, not knocking them. <laughs> um, but anyway, they did this, and I little by little I identified. And there was one guy, and if you got called on, you would stand up and, and talk. And there was one guy that was a few feet in front of me that stood up, and he told my story. He was, came out of a blackout. He had a revolver in his mouth. He went back in the blackout, came to the next morning on the floor. I had exactly the same thing happen to me except for I had a knife. And... And I walked away from that meeting with just planted the seed, hope. So whenever, you know, for, you know, we can't keep it unless we give it away. And in order for me to give it away, I got to remember what it was like to be a newcomer and what works on a newcomer. And in the chapter, Working with Others, it talks about, you know, we can win over the confidence of another alcoholic better than anybody. We, it's our unique gift. And in the family afterwards, it says, you know, cling to the thought that in God's hands our dark past is our greatest possession. It can literally advert death and misery for others. And that's through that identification. So uh, in, in, the, in my daily recovery and my sobriety practicing this stuff, that's one of the things. I go to meetings, you know, and there's a, there's a place in meetings, and all the guys I sponsor and, and, of course, me, is there's a place where I ended up having to quit being a taker in meetings, and I had to be a giver. Being a taker in meetings is, uh, gets awfully boring. Meetings become dull and boring for me if I'm a taker. And a taker, I mean just sitting and not participating. And when I'm a giver in a meeting, whether it's in service or whether it's in trying to carry the message or grabbing the newcomer afterwards, when I'm participating, that's when I'm enlarging my spiritual condition and, and enlarging my spiritual life, and I'm the one that gets the benefit. Um, Anyway, I got sober. Steps one, two, and three. Um, I was taught uh, that the first three steps are essentially becoming willing to turn my will and life over to God. Steps four through nine is actually how I turn it over, and steps 10 through 12 is how I keep it turned over. I did steps one, two, and three on the day I got sober, and I didn't know it. Um, I admitted I was an alcoholic. I fully conceded to my innermost self, like it says in the chapter more about alcoholism. Uh, In uh, We Agnostics, it says that we... Um, as soon as we 
believe or at least are willing to believe, then we assure you that you're on your way, that this is something in the nature of the, you know, this is a, a foundation that many people have, have recovered off of. And I had that conversation with myself that morning on February 5th, 1987. I didn't want to believe in God, but I remember saying, if I have to believe in God to make this stop, I will. And, um, and then I turned my will and life over to God. Now, I formally did those three steps later on, and I did them essentially out of reading the book, the first four chapters, the stories, being convinced of three ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could relieve us of our alcoholism and C, that God could and would if we were sought. Being convinced of those three ideas, you're now at step three. This is the way I was taken through the steps. Step three, um, I just, I, I, like I said, I did it on February 5th. I formally did it out of the big book, on my knees, with somebody, and I did the prayer. And then it was pointed out uh, after that that uh, the next page after that was it said, although this is a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to get rid of the things that have been blocking us, which we had to get down to causes and conditions, and this brings us to step four. Now, um, I was somebody that thought that that meant maybe six or nine months from now, not uh, right away, you know. And, um, and I didn't have a sponsor that urged me. But what happened is the pain of my alcoholism, that the, the anxiety and the depression started getting worse in sobriety. And I finally got to a place, well, just to give you an idea, um, I got to a place at about eight or nine months sober where uh, I was in a class. I was taking a psychology class. You know, you know, we, we get sober and we all want to go back to school. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was taking one class, psychology, and um, and they, we had a, a stress test. It, and it wasn't it wasn't for it was just an exercise and for the sake of an exercise. But it was a kind of like the MMPI, but a little bit smaller than that. And it was how we process stress. And it was an auditorium class of maybe 150 people or so. And the, uh, the professor was in the program, sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, you know, we self-tested and, and, uh, or self-graded it. And he said, who scored between 0 and 25? And about, you know, 10% of the class is in. He said, you guys process stress, great. Who scored between 25 and 50? Mo the majority of the class raised their hand. You process stress normally. You don't have any significant events in your life, blah, blah, blah. Who scored between 50 and 75? About the remaining, uh, you know, 25 or th third of the class raised their hand. He said, you guys have a little bit of stress in your life, maybe midterm, so forth. Anybody score above 75? Nobody. Anybody score above 100? Nobody. I scored 146. <laughs> and I went up to him afterwards, and I said, uh, I said, you know, Dr. Um, so-and-so, I scored 146, you know, I mean, uh, you know, and he had said, he said the people that score above 100 typically are institutionalized or locked up in federal penitentiaries. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, this was concerning, and, uh, <laughs> and I went up to him and I said, hey, you know, what's, you know, I scored 146, and he said, Chris, he goes, untreated alcoholism and a lot of people manifest itself in anxiety and depression. Anybody in their first year of sobriety would score that high, especially if they haven't done their fourth step. <laughs> Do your fourth step. <laughs> and so, um, you know, about a month later, uh, I got on that, and... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I got to a place, I got, a pla I got to a place of desperation and sobriety. And I started on my fourth step. And uh, I, I really actually I got to a place where I was going to commit suicide. And I was either I was going to work these steps exactly as they're outlined in the big book. And when I got to step 12, if I still felt this way, I was going to kill myself. And uh, so I started in, did the fourth step. And I did the fourth step out of the big book. Um, I also wrote an autobiography, which my sponsor asked me to do. Because it says in there that we have to tell somebody all of our life story. So it was custom of this group to write an autobiography. And in that autobiography, they asked that uh, you wrote down every deep, dark secret, everything that you have guilt, shame, and remorse over, even if it doesn't fit into the resentment category, the fear category, or the sexual relations category. 
And I did that. And I got together with my sponsor to do my fifth step. And, um, and, uh, and this is important also when working with others, and which, you know, working with others is, uh, I mean, that's, uh, it's a huge part of my deal, whether it's standing up here trying to share a little bit of me or whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in sponsorship, um, you know, working with others. You know, I can't keep it unless I, I give it away. I like that one part in, uh, I think it's to the wives or maybe in the family afterwards where it says, uh, you know, father feels that he's struck uh, a gold mine and, uh, and it will pay him endless dividends for the rest of his life as long as he's willing to mine it and give away the entire product. And uh, anyway, in this fifth step, a uh, very important thing happened, and that was my sponsor sat down with me, and before I even started reading anything, he told me his deep, dark secrets. And it was just like, bam. You know, all of a sudden, I wasn't the only one, because I, I came into that step thinking that I was the only person that was not locked up or institutionalized that had done some of the things that I had done. And immediately, the magic of that process started to happen. That identification, it was okay, and you know, he had done it, and you know, he, you know, other people had done it. And um, um, one of the things uh, I did in the fifth and in, in, in the fifth, sixth, and seventh step was um, I had a habit of prior to doing the the, the inventory process, um, I would go into a mirror and I would either beat myself up or build myself up, and then two or three minutes after building myself up, I'd be right back down in the gutter because at, at a gut level I knew I was worthless. You know, low self-worth and low self-esteem and feelings of inadequacy were some of my character defects and underlying causes and conditions. And I had this habit whenever I was, you know, uh, it wasn't an issue when I was drinking, but when I wasn't drinking, I would go in and I would assess myself in the mirror. And I, and I did my fifth step and, and halfway through my fifth step we took a break and I went into the bathroom and I started to do this um, again, and uh, you know this normal process I'd do. And I was looking at myself in the mirror, and I couldn't identify what was going on. You know, what's going on? You know, I'm I'm not having this reaction to myself like I normally have, which started in my soul. Um, and I, I sat there, and all of a sudden it dawned on me I had comfort. And for the first time in my life, I'd had comfort in my own skin without having to take those 10 drinks. And from there, uh, you know, of course, I went and reported to the group that nothing happened. I mean, I dismissed that immediately. But the truth is, is that that is the reaction I've had to life since then, for the most part, when I'm in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous and when I'm participating in Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I'm participating in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's important for me to define that because... Um, Participating in Alcoholics Anonymous for me is not the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. The fellowship is vital. The meetings are vital. It seems as though people that stop going to meetings end up drinking. But when I talk about participating in Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, for me, participating in what's in the first 164 pages in the book and practicing you know, the design for living that's outlined in there in my daily living. Anybody, or I think, at least I can. I can come into a meeting and say stuff. I mean, I've been here 18 years. I can quote the big book. But it's, it's, it's irrelevant unless, for me, unless I walk out that door and I'm trying to apply it to my life outside of here. I'm trying to apply it in uh, my marriage, you know. And I, my wife's here tonight, and uh, I usually introduce her as my uh, exercise in patience and tolerance. But she's, uh, she's uh, you know, we've been married for 12 and a half years. I'm somebody that didn't have relationships, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, all this stuff, and I'm not going to go into that um, to stay with the format, but, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, the participation is, is outside of the rooms of alcoholics and in, I mean, and in, what I'm doing in here, and, uh, and, and that, is, that is crucial for me. The fellowship, for me, I don't believe, spells out the necessary spiritual experience in order for me to have that personality change that's sufficient to recover. It helps and it's important, but it's through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous that I've had the changes that I've had. Um, and it's also in participating in, in my own recovery through other things. One of the things that uh, I want to get into is uh, 
in step six and seven, um, real quickly, is uh, you know there's two paragraphs in the big book. Um, I became willing to have these character defects removed, and then I ask. And one of the things in, in the prayer where I ask is I ask God to remove the things that stand in the way of my usefulness to you and to my fellows. And that doesn't mean that all my character defects are going to be removed. Uh, what it means is that there are maybe some character defects that still are alive in my life, but they provide some use. And uh, they are useful to the other people that are behind me. Because I'll tell you, the people that are ahead of me that still have struggle with their character defects and still have to put pen to paper and still have to you know, do all this stuff, it's important for me and it's life-saving for me to know that they still struggle with things. I was thinking as uh, we had somebody introduce themselves with over 50 years, one of the best things I've heard in an AA meeting in the last two years is I was at a guy in one of my groups who at his 51st AA birthday, he stood at a podium and said, you know, I still have difficulties with the third step. And, I mean, I sat there and I was just like, what a load off, off of me. I don't have to have it perfect. This guy's been doing it for 51 years. He's an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he still struggles with some of this stuff. Um, in step seven, it's important for me also to, uh, you know, after I do that prayer, is to participate in that process. The 12 by 12, which um, says... God will not render me white as snow without my cooperation. I was taught that what my cooperation was was to participate with the seventh step. And that means not only taking the seventh step, but I was taught that alcoholics cannot feel their way into a new way of acting or think their way into a new way of uh, or or think their way into a new way of acting. They have to act their way into a new way of thinking and act their way into a new way of feeling. And part of the seventh step is when I turn over these character defects it's to go out there, and when I start to get those things that are coming up again, is I have to turn them over again and then act as if they're being removed because maybe they are. And, uh, and, and in steps eight and nine, you know, steps eight, uh, the list, a lot of the list was already formed when I did my fourth step. I also had amends that were not in my fourth step. There was no resentment or fear or sex relation attached to them. I just owed an amends. And, uh, and I made direct amends. Direct amends, um, you know, wherever possible. And um, and one of the things there, uh, I don't have any very good amends stories. Mine were pretty dull and boring. But um, one thing I was taught is if somebody that I owe amends to died and, and, uh, and I owed them an amends was to write them a letter in the first person and then go someplace and read it to them as if they were there because maybe they are. And I had one of those that I had to do. The 10th step I already touched on. The 11th step has been vital for me. My first sponsor was a uh, ex-Buddhist monk. And so right from the beginning, I was thrown into meditation. And I've done all sorts of meditation, you know, from sitting on Zafu pillows and holding my hands a certain way to having mantras to doing walking. Currently, I'm sitting in my car with a cup of Starbucks for about 30 minutes every morning. Uh, and, I, and I'm quiet for about 30 minutes. And I'm quiet with the idea that if I can quiet my head enough that later on when I do get those intuitive thoughts, it's, it's quiet enough that I can hear it. And in step 12, um, just one quick thing on step 12. I had 14 days sober. Uh, one of my lower companions, well, my only lower companion, although if he was here tonight, he would say I was his lower companion. He saw that I hadn't had a drink for 14 days, and he wanted to know, you know what, what happened. How, how did I do that? And so I did exactly what working with others says, and I shared my experience, and I dwelled on the hopelessness of uh, our situation, and then I invited him to an AA meeting. And uh, he stayed sober for about 30 days, and then he went back out, and then he came back in, and he's going to be celebrating 18 years in, I think, five days or so. And uh, my point with that is, is that, you know, you hear every once in a while around here that you may, you know, you may need to be around here a while before you can help anyone. My experience is not that. My experience is, is that uh, somebody with 14 days can help somebody with zero days and so forth. And the reality is, is that it doesn't matter whether you know, I'm, I have any effect the matter, the, because who I'm really helping is me. I'm the one participating in, in my recovery. 
and I'm the one that I'm the one that enlarges my spiritual life by getting out on the firing line and trying to carry the message to other alcoholics. And uh, I'm uh, I'm out of question and answers now. Okay. All right. Thanks. Questions? What? Yeah. Well, oh, the, 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 the biblical guy? No. The question was, do I know what the guy said? I have no idea. It just seemed to be related to what the police said, but I, and I don't know that it matters. In my head, it seemed to be related, and I took it as inspiration. And you know, my point with that story is is that is that my head, I dismiss things like that as trivial and stupid. Naturally, I have to make a conscious effort because part of our 10th and 11th step is we're supposed to look for inspiration and ask for intuitive thoughts and that I look for those things and I actually act on them as if they actually are intuitive thoughts. And it says I may pay with some consequences when I'm new because I'm not used to this, but the fact is, is for me, I have to make a conscious decision to do that. Thanks. Yeah. What? question was, what's my take on acceptance? Um, that's a, not a real good topic for me. <laughs> but, um, you know, acceptance is a byproduct for me of working a program. Uh, I don't know. It seems as though in some meetings you hear people talk about, I just have to accept this. And I just have to, I have to practice acceptance. And I, I always think to myself, okay, how do you do that? How, do, how do you exactly do you do that? And I don't really know. It's the same thing with balance. You hear these people talking about, I need balance in my life. And it's like, okay, how do you do that? And it, it sounds like they're grabbing the bull by the horns and they're shoving their life into balance or they're shoving their emotions into acceptance. Um, doesn't work for me. And it may work for other people. And there's things that I do that, you know, I mean, I, I go to a group that, or I, I don't go to a group. I sponsor a guy who goes to a group. But on, there's a sign on the wall that says that, uh, if what you hear here cannot be reconciled with what's in the first 164 pages of the big book, you may have been better off not hearing it at all. And, um, and, that, and that, that may be true and it may not be true. I mean, there, there's some experiences that are not in the big book that I have followed that work for me, and there's others that don't. Acceptance is something that is a byproduct of me doing my job in Alcoholics Anonymous. If I'm having something that I can't accept when I go into the steps, and you know, and I and I revisit some of the principles in the steps, like in step three, where it says, you know, here's the how and the why of it. I have to quit playing God. It just didn't work. I go there. Am I playing God? Okay. And from here on after, I'm going to be the director, or you know, God's going to be the director. I'm going to be the uh, actor. You know, he's the, you know, whatever, and I'm the agent, and and so forth. When I start participating in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I carry the message, when I'm practicing prayer and meditation, when I'm keeping my side of the street clean, acceptance is a byproduct of that. It seems to come naturally. It's not anything that I can, I can just go grab a hold of. Um, it's like surrender. Unfortunately, I wish I could manufacture surrender because I get so much benefit out of surrender. Um, I wish I could go around and surrender, you know, but I don't seem to have that ability. And there may be people in AA that can. They, they seem to be able to. I have to go through a whole process of stuff before I get to surrender. And the, the, the benefits of being surrendered are, are tremendous, but I can't seem to do it. I just When I stay in the middle of AA and practice this stuff, surrender comes easier. Acceptance comes easier. Balance is a byproduct of me focusing on a spiritual program of action, not me focusing on balance. Thanks. How do you think you score on the stress test? Well, today, the question was, how would I score on this stress test? 
Um, that's an interesting question because uh, I actually took an MMPI when I had three years sober. And I had a, this guy that all he did, his entire job was to analyze MMPIs. And he got mine and he said, my God, you're sensitive. And uh, I said, I am? And he said, yeah, you're, you're off the charts on sensitivity. He goes, you, he goes, you must take everything personally. And I said, well, I said, you know, um, I said, I've improved a lot. You know, I've been sober for three years. And, uh, and through uh, no therapy other than Alcoholics Anonymous and practicing a spiritual way of life and practicing its principles in my daily living, when I had 11 or 12 years, I went. And, this guy was in the program, and uh, he, he was, this was his profession, though, outside. Um, I went back and, um, and took an MMPI again. And, uh, and he scored it. We sat down, he analyzed it, and he said, yeah, you, you, know, you look good. And I said, well, am I sensitive? And he said, a little bit. And I said, well, I said, last time I was off the charts. And he said, no, not this time. And I said, pull, can you pull that record? And so anyway, he pulled the record. And uh, the record was significantly different. From three years to 12 years, I was a changed person. And yet I never, I never once focused on becoming less sensitive. I focused on you know, the 10th step carrying the message, you know, and practicing prayer and meditation, being of service and, uh, and those things. And through, through practicing spiritual principles in Alcoholics Anonymous, I changed. Thanks. Question was, uh, what's one of the most difficult things I've had to go through in sobriety and what Solutions I've used to go through them. Um, probably the most, there's a couple, there's not any one that stands out. Uh, one was early marriage and uh, in learning to be a companion and a partner. And um, it, once again, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to sound like a little bit like a broken record. I'm not somebody who does very well on a frontal assault on my problems. We tried marriage counseling. It's the closest we ever came to divorcing was in marriage counseling. And, uh, and, and, I'm not, and I'm not, hey, marriage counseling may work for other people. I'm just saying for, this is what happened to me. When I focus on the problem, my, my solutions are always worse than the problem. My thinking is my problem. How am I going to think my way into a good marriage? And so what, what I've done, uh, what I did in early marriage was I practiced a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. If I want a good marriage, I need to go work with newcomers. If I want a good marriage, I need to be of service in Alcoholics Anonymous and then take that same attitude of service outside of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and out into life, including my marriage. Uh, Pausing when agitated and doubtful, like it says, is very easy to do in here most of the time. Um, but it becomes, it's more difficult out there. But who cares if I can be polite and pause and, you know, but, and, and then I'm an ass out there. I've got to take that, those same principles out there. But again, a frontal assault on my problems is not, uh, has never been a very good solution for me. Um, when I practice a spiritual program of action, thing, life just seems to fall into place for me. It, marriage and work and work relations and, and all that kind of stuff. It's no different than when I was new. When I had six months sober, you, you know, I'd be like, you know, but God, you guys don't understand. I, I'm being evicted. Uh, I'm about ready, you know, I'm uh, you know, this far from being homeless. And then the, the senior AA members would say, just go to meetings. It'll be okay. And I'd be like, you know, what, what the hell does going to meetings have to do with me being evicted? And it's, and, and it's, the, it's, it's the same principle today. There's something inside my head, by the way, that uh, left unattended uh, will, will think that now that I have 18 years or 10 years, that the solution's changed, that the solution's different than it was in my first year or my first two or three years that maybe I need to go out and get a different book. 
you know, there's always, in, in my group, there's always the get the new book club, you know. There's a kind of a group of them that's like, oh, I got the new book on such and such. And I'm not dismissing that. That may be very beneficial and helpful to those people. I, it's, it hasn't for me. I'm somebody that if I, if I stay in the solution that's outlined in the, in the big book and I do my job in AA and I, and I continue to practice this stuff, you know, the promises says that God's going to do for me what I can't do for myself. And that doesn't, you know, and that, that, that doesn't end after my first year. That's included. Uh, another real quick, the other thing is accepting character defects. Um, I have, my biggest thing in sobriety, my, this, here's my biggest one, is fear. Fear, uh, I've had some character defects that when I originally did my fourth and fifth step, have 99% of them have been lifted. 99% of the power in them have been lifted. And I have others that a little bit have been lifted and they've improved over time. And as I've continued to work, you know, and continue to, uh, I don't want to say work on them, but uh, because it's the process and God that does the change. And I create the environment where change can take place. Um, and then God changes me. Fear has been the most difficult one. And I've got to tell you, I still have fears today. And I've got one that's just, I have irrational fears still. That's not maybe not very good news for you new guys, but um, uh, I tell you, from where I came from, uh, I'm participating in life. I am. I own a business. I have a job. I have a driver's license. I have all this stuff, and I'm actually a participant in life today as a result of practicing the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I never was a participant in life prior to AA. I couldn't be. I absolutely was rendered completely useless by my character defects and my fear, and my drinking. And um, fear's been a big one. I have an irrational fear. In San Francisco, I will not cross the Golden Gate Bridge or the Bay Bridge. It terrifies me. I, I go into a sheer panic halfway through the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, it absolutely terrifies me. And I've tried a frontal assault on that. I've tried uh, all these other things on it. And I've gotten to a place where I've been comfortable with going across the Golden Gate. I used to live in, for a short period in Sausalito, and I worked in the financial district. So I crossed the Golden Gate every day. Um, but then after non-practicing it, it's come back. I have a friend of mine who lives in Georgia. She's got 25 years in the program. And she suffers from the same irrational fear. And, I don't know, and by the way, I never had this until I quit drinking. But uh, um, <laughs> the... Uh, the um, the fact is, is that, uh, and, I, and I've talked to her at length about this, and the reality is, is that the hardest thing for me is accepting that I'm not perfect and that Alcoholics Anonymous has not struck me fearless, that I think there's something in me also that, because sometimes you hear people, you think after 10 or 20 years that they have no fears and they have no character defects, and there's a part of me that has that expectation that I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have this. I have 18 years. I should be able to cross the Golden Gate. That's stupid. I mean, I should be able to do that. And it's been acceptance around that. And one of the things I finally came to is that, is that um, if I didn't have that, uh, um, it's one of the things that keeps me humble. It keeps me right size. And in one way, it's a, it's a big gift because uh, otherwise I have a tendency to, my head just, just you know. So anyway, thanks. Yes. The question was, how is my prayer and meditation different today than it was 18 years ago? Um, one thing that's, uh, it's just, it's evolved over time. And uh, one of the things, that prayer, I, I don't think there's been a day of my sobriety where I have not asked God in the morning to keep me sober for that day. And at the end of the day where I've said, thank you for keeping me sober. Um, how the prayer has evolved is I've gone through places where I've taken literal, you know, parts out of the big book, out of, the, out of 10 and 12, where, you know, it's, okay, now I'm supposed to ask, you know, for him to direct my thinking, especially keeping it divorced from, you know, this, this, and this. And then I'm supposed to ask for the next step. And then I've taken it and applied the principle of the third step that says, the meditation, um, uh, the meditation is, 
the meditation has changed from um, more of kind of a Eastern Zafu pillow type stuff, counting my exhales backwards, to finally I realize it's like, I don't think God really cares if I sit on a Zafu pillow and count backwards and do mantras. I, I don't know. I'm actually in the process. I'm thinking about changing what I do right now. Um, Right now, I, 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 because I get up so early, the only way I can do it is if I go to Starbucks, get coffee, and I get in my car, and I sit there, I read a couple things, and for 25 to 30 minutes, I sit quietly, quietly and I breathe, and, um, and that's it. If my mind's racing too much, I, do, I have some exercises that, will, uh, that help me quiet it. One is, as I'll, I'll do on my inhales, I'll say, God in, Chris out. God in, Chris out. Um, or I'll do God in, fear out, God in, fear out. Uh, the other one is counting exhales backwards uh, is one. Mantras, I'll take little pieces out of the big book. Like um, like one I use is I have to turn all things over, over to the Father of Light that presides over us all. And so I use that word. I like that word, Father of Light. So it provokes something spiritual by just hearing it. So I'll say Father of Light, Father of Light. But it's always changing. I am in the process of considering changing it right now. Thanks. Yes? Terry, I'm Terry. I hear you talking about the book Living in Those Hands. Yes. How long did it take? It took as long. Uh, it, it was when I did my fist up. It was when I started getting comfortable in my own skin. Um, and I did my fist up at almost one year, which is not the way I sponsor people. I, 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 got, to the, I got to the place of where the, the ism, the insanity of me. I mean, you know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought I had two problems. I thought I was a daily oblivion drinker, and I was crazy. And what I found out is, is, that, is, is that that's what alcoholism is. Alcoholism, for me, manifests itself untreated in... Depression, anxiety, feelings of low self-worth, uh, unhappiness, no matter what. You know, I mean, it's you, in complete, total self-centeredness. Uh, it took, as for me to start getting comfortable in my own skin, was when I did my fist up. And, it's, and it just happened to be right at about a year. I don't think the time had anything to do with it. I think the action did. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, the question was uh, in regards to what I said about the step seven and participating with that process. Um, the question was if I could give an example is specifically to regarding inadequacy and low self-worth, how I act as if and meet God halfway. Is that right? Um, the, uh, I can't do the seventh step prayer and then go sit on the couch and turn the TV on and expect God to instantly do it. I have to continue to take action. And, you know, and if there's amends I need to make, and, and, uh, and it's whether, it, regardless of whether it's on my fourth step in my original seventh step or if I'm participating in those steps in the tenth step. I was taught the tenth step is steps four through nine separated by the word and. Um, but uh, on the seventh step... Um, an example of that would be, for instance, I know uh, there's a girl in my home group who's a, a supermodel. Um, she's been on the cover of 30 magazines and and uh, and so forth. And, and if she was here, she'd tell you this story, so I'm not saying anything. But um, one of the things that she did on her seventh step, uh, and I know this because I just talked to her about this recently, and um, she had a problem with... Um, She'd dress down, wear baggy clothes, no makeup, was embarrassed about her profession. She thought that people would think she was stupid because, you know, she was a model. And the same thing. One of the things that she did is uh, she participated in step six and seven is she used to, when people would ask, oh, my God, I saw you on the cover of Vogue, um, she'd, you know, kind of be snotty to them and 
go off because she was embarrassed by it. And so her, her participation in the seventh step was when somebody would come up and say, oh my God, I just saw you in Vogue. She would then immediately do kind of a mini seventh step prayer in her head. And then she'd say, what would somebody, how would somebody with self-esteem or high self-worth respond to this? And then she'd respond by saying, oh, you did. What did you think of the layout? And she would act as somebody that has self-esteem. And I'm telling you, um, in, in she went through this thing in about a two-month period to where she was used to come to our home group completely dressed down because she was embarrassed about what she did and because of her low self-worth to where now she sometimes she dresses up. And, I mean, and, and she'll, she's even showed uh, uh, friends of hers in the program and so forth her portfolio and some of her work, which is something two months ago she couldn't do. She's got six years and she's just getting through this. And um, I can't think of any specific examples offhand of my own, but that's exactly how uh, I would participate in, in step seven. Thanks. Yes. I did. Uh, the question is, is how has my God evolved? And um, what was uh, the second part of that? And, and how, how my, uh, my understanding of that has changed over time. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to articulate that very well. Um, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, like I said, I just had a willingness to believe. Uh, I, and I was also taught that if you're new, which, by the way, I know there's uh, somebody here at the first meeting, the God stuff, man, don't let that stuff scare you. When I came down, that was one of the things I didn't want to be involved with Alcoholics Anonymous for was because all that God talk. Um, but I, I found out that I didn't even have to believe in God to make a start in this program. All I had to do to make a start was seek God. It says that A, B, and then C, that God could and would if he were sought. Not found, just sought. And so just through, and it, one person put it away. Some people said, fake it till you make it. So I prayed to a God that I didn't even believe in or, you know, or I didn't know what I believed in. Another guy put it away that I really liked. He said, he goes, you don't have to believe in God to make a start in this program. You just have to take actions as if you believe in God. And that's what I started doing. I took actions as if I believed in God. And uh, little by little, I started believing God. You know, and I, I did the, you know, called it my higher power for a while and a power greater than myself. And then I kind of got tired of all that and started calling God for a lack of a better word. We used to say that. And then, uh, then pretty soon it just became God. And um, I don't know, for a long time I thought God was a feeling, and um, I, I found out that that's not true. God's not a feeling. For a long time, um, I used to get those God buzzes. The problem was is that when I didn't have that God buzz, I always wondered what was wrong. And I finally found out that you know, God's not a feeling. You know? uh, it, says that, it says that when we seek God, that, you know, and, and, and he doesn't make too hard of terms for us, but when we seek him, he'll always disclose himself to us. So what really matters for me is the fact that I'm taking the actions. And uh, sometimes I have a feeling of a presence of God, and, and sometimes I don't. And sometimes I still question God, by the way. Um, and that's important for me to say that because, uh, um, I mean, there's days where I'm just like, is there a God? You know, and, uh, and then, you know, I come back to, well, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter today. The fact is, is by praying to a God, whether there is one or not, doing all these actions, I'm somebody that had an obsession to drink alcohol on a daily basis, regardless of the consequences, and I haven't had an obsession to drink alcohol. And I'm somebody that can't live in the world without being anesthetized by a certain amount of alcohol, but by turning my will and life over to God, whether he exists or not, and taking these actions, I have enough comfort to go out in the world and, and, and live out there. Um, so the, the major evolution in my God is that, is that I finally came to terms that God's not a feeling. And I'm not too sure how to articulate it after that. I, it's, 
it's more of a sense. It's kind of a, a sense of uh, of, uh, of being okay, and that and that I'm I have something that's that's going to keep me okay. So, thanks. We out of time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.